Yeah, good morning. And first, uh, thank you very much to Eblex and to John and Phil for inviting a, a port man up here to tell you about what impact China have had on the Danish Crown Group overall. Uh, we got um, access to China from the Danish side roughly eight, ten years ago, and it definitely changed our mentality and our, our way of thinking. It's completely the opposite of what we meet over here in the UK or in Europe from a retailer demand. They value things differently, and it takes a lot of time and adapt to, these, to this way of thinking. Um, we got the UK approved from our abattoirs roughly two and a half years ago by a lot of work from BPEX, and as you'll see later on, it definitely paid off what they did, so big credit to that. But first of all, let me just start with introducing to, to Danish Crown and, and what we are as a, as a company. We put predominantly into pork, it's a cooperative owned by the Danish farmers um, and within that we've gone in more and more into further processing under the tulip umbrella. So 10 years ago roughly our turnover would be 80% within the abattoirs and 20% further processing. Today it's more 50-50. Um, this is the mission statement and a lot of people they don't really get it. Uh, when, when I talk to my suppliers and all that, we are here to optimize our raw materials. So we have to pay the highest price for raw materials because we're owned by the farmers. So it's in our DNA that whatever we get out of a Danish abattoir, we need to return the absolute maximum because they are the owners, they are the key stakeholders, they are the ones that are going to fund our future. Some key figures, 8 billion turnover in 13, 14 roughly. Approximately 21 million pigs have been, been slaughtered across the group within Germany, or Denmark, Germany, and the UK, Poland, and Sweden. We got roughly 8,500 owners, and out of them, half of them are pig producers, the other half is cattle and sheep producers. And as you can see, we are slaughtering 600,000 beasts a year as well. So, we are the second largest exporter of. Uh, of pork, and we are the largest pig producer in the UK, uh, in, in, in Europe. And if you add, also take the further processing and, and add all our subsidiaries together, we are also the largest. That doesn't mean always the best, that just means that we always have to spend to make sure we're in front of our competitors and make sure we're efficient. Um, and most of what we do is to export. 92% of whatever has been produced in Denmark is being exported out of the country. And that means that Danish Crown is very high on the Danish agenda of, and we contribute to the Danish agriculture. Uh, so roughly it's 39% of the agriculture, the other 40% is ALA within the dairy industry, and then you've got a lot of small other businesses contributed to it. And again, 4.3%, it does sound like a big figure, but for a country like Denmark, there's 5 million people, 4.3% of export is coming from Danish Crown, so we got a big social responsibility as well uh, with, our, with our staff in Denmark. And then just a little note, every hour we are sending now two containers to China, um, all year round. Again, this is how we are divided into to, to different segments, so up here fresh meat is where we have all the abattoirs and down here is, is the further <coughs> processing and Tulip UK is, is represented here in the UK. But over here, the two main thing is that shop, they do all the casings for us. So they're the world's largest casing producer, and they will do a lot of New Zealand uh, sheep casings and all the pork casings from Denmark, UK, Germany. It's all being shipped all to China or to Portugal, where we've got factories. So we got roughly 2,000 people in China. We opened that facility 10 years ago. Um, and they will do roughly 50% of the world's um, casing production, clean casings. Then at the same time over here, S-Food, and I'll come back to that later, but they do all our export into China. It's not being done on the Danish Crown umbrella. And that's because we see Danish Crown as a, as a, as a, as a country that's going to still develop. And the S-Food brand has always been used to open access to new countries. But currently we've got four sales offices out there. Ten years ago, we had one, we had four people. So 
So here today we are up to 45 employees and I'm pretty sure if we meet in three, four years time again, we will have 90. Um, we started down in Hong Kong 10 years ago with five people. Uh, and as time has developed, as we got market ac access, as the market has matured in China, we've moved upwards here on the, west on, on the east coast. And we'll come back to later why and how. So, just a little bit step backwards because commodity has a huge impact on the cost of production. I can't really do anything on wheat price, soy price, and, and, and those things. That's, that's a pressure that's coming from the outside. And I think it really sort of hit my from what commodity is. It was a few years ago, I went down to see how rapeseed oil is being traded. So within Tulip UK, we buy roughly 50,000 litres of rapeseed oil every week for our frying operation. And we were invited by um, MDA to go to London and see how they trade rapeseed oil. And basically, I thought I was coming into a room with a lot of people trading and, and so on. There was only computers. And then there was one, one guy sitting monitoring these computers, what, what they were doing. And, and in the end, there is 300 billion pounds worth of rapeseed oil being traded every year. The physical stuff of it is only 10% of that, so 30 billion. And it's all being traded between computers. That was sort of the day that this, for me, put it into perspective, a commodity. And it doesn't matter if it's pork, chicken, lamb, beef, what we're in. These things today, we really can't, we, we, we can't control them, but we can adapt to them in the best possible way and make sure we look forward on how do we then optimize our carcass balance. And this one here, if you go to Danish Crown, it's an important tool. It's also an important tool in the UK business because whatever cut there is on a pick, there is a clear plan of make sure that you send those cuts to the, to, to, the, to the market that is paying the absolute highest price. So China, for example, wasn't here 10 years ago. They now are getting a bigger and bigger impact. And you'll see later on that they are now moving into primal cuts as well. 10 years ago, France, it's still here, was 50% of all legs was sent to France to further processing. Today, it's only five. And if you sort of put it into perspective, I see a lot of so a statistic, a lot of lamb is going into France. Somehow, we were vulnerable because 50% of our production were going into France, but they were paying the absolute highest price for that cut. But overnight, it changed, and we had to find new market for it. Russia is another class example. As you've seen, the band of Russia, has, it has taken a big hit on, on our, how to balance the, the, the pick price. It's roughly between 10 and 14 pence that is hitting the Danish pick price, not having access to Russia anymore. It's been an absolute disaster, and it's changed the whole market in the UK, or in Europe, sorry, because China, uh, Russia were taking fat, they were taking shoulder meat, they were taking the cuts that we were not really using in the UK, or in Europe, as such. So, there is also a risk of having access to these countries from time to time, but the upside is far bigger. And hopefully we can get this Russian situation sorted because pig farmers will suffer if we don't. Going into China, and it is the, the world's fasting growing economy. This is just some scaring numbers. I didn't want to put Denmark in because we're only five billion, a million, and it doesn't look sort of. But so whatever China is growing, uh, it's just phenomenal. And compared to the UK, I think these figures speak for itself. They have a phenomenal growth. But if you talk to Chinese people, they say, we need to keep this gro growth going because people are now getting into this habit of this, this economy is booming. Inflation is, is, is pretty high. Uh, employment rate is reasonably low out there as well. Uh, you can then question if 4.2% is the right because there is still a lot of family business now. How is all that data put together? But all in all, it's a country that's here for the long term. No doubt about it and they are getting into a Western-style life. Chinese production of pigs is roughly 550 million a year, and they have, and this is the, the important bit, they got a self-sufficient of 97.5%, and the prediction are that they will go down to 95% over the next five years. So it's just opened the opportunity up even, even further 
for us as exporters. And they, they consume roughly 1.7 million pigs per day. That's quite a lot. That means our arbiters need to work for 20 days just to feed them. It's staggering numbers. And then they import uh, 1.5 million tons. Take or give, they don't really know what that figure is because in, in China there are two channels. There is the Hong Kong channel, which is, what is classified as the Great Channel, and then you've got direct to China. Um, but it's huge. A little bit about their farming structure, which is quite interesting, and we talked about it last night as well, because they are, the Chinese are now starting to figure out they have to consolidate. They have a growing population, and they need to feed them. So, Shanghai is the biggest producer of pork in China, with roughly 10, 15 million pigs a year they're slaughtering. They've just bought Smithfield in the States, which is the biggest export of pork. Why did they buy them? It was to get a stake not in the abattoirs and all that, but it was in the primal production and get hold of the genetics. Because the, the, the Chinese are thinking long term and consolidation of how they're actually going to put whole, the whole chain together of making sure they can feed their own people. Over here, you can see it's still predominant small family farms. I won't even call them farms, but a little house where they've got pigs in. Uh, and I've been up seeing a few, and it's it's. 30, 50 year behind European standard, but it, they are coming, and they're coming fast, and they're putting money against it. And that's why you can also see sort of bigger farms starting to, to, to grow, and the big farms above uh, 3,000 pigs will grow very fast over the coming years. And then at the same time, what they're doing is that they're simply closing slaughterhouses that are not fit, fit for purpose. They're just shutting them down. And in China, you can't argue about it. They will just, they will just shut them. Uh, and, and they will do that to optimize their supply chain. That's the only thing this is about. <clears throat> so this was China, how it looked like. Uh, this is more how it is today. Uh, and first of all, I apologize. This is, some of this is in Danish. Um, it's not very good, but uh, I, I couldn't get the computer to work. But what it is, is explaining you what is the middle class, how, that, how fast that's growing. And, and for me, when I look at this, it's frightening numbers that by 2030, two-thirds of the middle class would be from Asia. Today, you've got 300 million Chinese that have a living standard that is on European level or above. And you got this graph here, and it, it's just sort of predicting what is going on. You got a lot of more people moving away from the small uh, cities into, in, 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 into Shanghai, into Beijing. They all want to get be part of living in, in, in these cities. So today there's all 40 cities with more than 2 million. It's staggering numbers. 10 years ago, that was 32 cities. So you can just see they're moving people into big cities. And that's then, yeah, growing population, growing demand for food. Internally, we can't say that enough because we, we need to be on the ball here to make sure we, got it, we are represented out there. Because when they then move into the, to the big city, their eating habits and their diet change. And, and, and here, as you can see, it suddenly starts to move up. And it doesn't matter if it's beef, pork or poultry. They just change their diet quite dramatically because they, they, they want to live what is called the Western or the, or the US style lifetime. And that's for us as, as an exporter. It's a fantastic <coughs> opportunity to be part of. And this, that's also why, if you look at our sales of where are we based, we're actually based where, where the growth is. And, and in this region here, and hopefully you can see it, that's where we've got 300 million now Chinese on an EU or <coughs> above living standard. Tremendous buying power and opportunity for us to grab. Again here, over the last three years, don't want to dwell too much into it, but again, the ton is, is going up and so is the, the, the value of what we're exporting out there. And this is encouraging for all of us. And you can actually see lamb is the one with the percentage biggest increase. But the, the global prediction is that it, 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 the protein will increase between 16, 18 percent over the next 15 years. 
And this is just looking back 10 years of what has actually happened when this whole transformation has. So if you, if, if you remember back a few slides where you can see the Chinese 10 years ago were starting to move into the cities, it's 21% that their consumption of meat is up. Uh, and in EU and the US we are going back. Is that a reflection of the economy as well? Yeah, it definitely is. And what we can afford. Uh, and you've got Japan and Russia. Uh, don't under, I know this is about China, but don't underestimate Russia. They, what they're doing as well, they, they, they're st now setting up their own f feed chain as well, like China. They're very much united between tri China and Russia now. And if, if you look at the landscape, they, they want to be partners in this going forward. And they're both in it for the long game. So putting, what, putting us out of not being able to, to export to Russia, what he has done, he's already now established himself as being self-sufficient on poultry. Five, eight years ago, it was 50% self-sufficient on poultry in Russia. And of course, it's close to, to China. So somehow they will also set up um, supply chains between them. Pork, big investment as well going on. And if you go to Kazakhstan, I know there is a lot of beef, actually an Italian beef company setting up supply chain just to supply beef into Russia. This is the pork balance. Um, not really a lot to be said apart from consumption is still higher than the, than the, than the national <coughs> production, no matter what, what protein you're in. So again, it'll, it, it, it's the one that gives us a sign that we have to invest and we have to be in China. So what do we then sell in China? When we started 10 years ago, it was ears, it was Riplets, it was bone, it was everything they could chew in. Uh, and the most strange things, we had a, uh, one of the sales guys coming in and the first thing he went into our abattoir was not we invite him into the line and go and have a look and... No, he, he, he went straight to, to look at the bin and was there anything we could recover from what we were putting into pet food and what we were putting in for destruction. Because, and, and to start with, our, we couldn't uh, not understand it, but our factory manager, he said, but don't look there. He said, yeah, but we, we use the whole pig, and so do we in Danish ground. We fought with it. We didn't. They were, what, what they have come up with, and how much they have taken from what you call pet food and into human consumption by just treating it with respect is quite phenomenal. Unfortunately, one of the things that the UK is not allowed to export to China is feet, our trotters. If we were allowed, there was between 80 to a pound more per kilo, if we had that on the list. And the reason why it didn't get through, allegedly, was that in one of the abattoirs, and doesn't matter where, but we, the Chinese didn't see us treating their feet with respect because it was just thrown in a bin, and we were not cleaning them afterwards. Massive mistake. But we wouldn't, the, the people in the abattoir wouldn't have known that the Chinese are so fussy about their quality. And, and, and they have a completely different set of mindset of what is food safety and what is high welfare. For them is that you treat their products with the deepest respect. So, yeah, the fifth quarter has the highest um, value in their balance. They don't know what to do with shoulder meat. They don't know what to do with a loin. It's sold cheaper than feet. Which is sort of... And another example is we're starting export of ears. We get, for the best ears, we will get above three pound. And before you were selling it to pet food for, on a good day, 50 pence. And then, but with ears now, we're putting them into shoe boxes. So there's a category one, two, and three of ears, depending on how many ears, earmarks they have and how clean they are. So in two, three, four of our abattoirs, we got a washing machine. And the only thing that washing machine is doing is washing the ears to make sure they're perfectly washed and presented. And they're, they're just laying beside each other like shoes in a box. But we do it because the value from 50 pence to three pound on when you kill, as we do, four, five hundred thousand pigs a week, it, it's, it adds significant added value to your carcass balance. So, going into a little bit of the retail sector in China, uh, and you've recently seen that Tesco, they're now part of, and I can't really pronounce it, but the Sugo group, um, and I think Tesco realized that 
to, to conquer the Chinese market is quite difficult. It's really difficult because it's a different. When you market, walk into a supermarket, uh, and, and Carrefour is maybe the one European that has been with most success out there because when you walk in there, there's just a lot of noise. Tesco didn't have noise. They, they were trying to do it the European way, but the consumers didn't really get that. Um, and now they're partnered up with this massive group. And, um, and over here, these are all their sales points. And that's because in China, 70% of what's been sold is sold on what is the wet market. And this is, uh, I don't know, hopefully you can see the pictures, but this is a wet market in Hong Kong. But wherever you go in every city, there are a lot of wet markets. Um, and you can buy everything. Uh, this is a clean wet market, by the way. <laughs> I think Phil and Alan, we were at a wet market in China, in Beijing. They were killing the fish on the floor. Uh, chicken, they were, they were killed, but they were just mix mixing it all together. And when we see that, we think that we can then come with our welfare. But they have a, again, they have a completely different mindset. That's not for them, that's not a problem, because that's part of their culture. It's also part of their culture, by the way. To have a fact or above that, but <laughs> so this is sort of the so the traditional channels, and they will remain the wet markets. They, they, even though they got 70, 80 percent today, it might go to 60, it might go to 55, but they are still going to be very dominant in the way they trade in China. There is a lot of black economy out there. There is a lot of cash. Uh, so please remember, Chinese are gamblers, and there is a lot of cash in China that needs to run around as well. So the wet market is there for the future. It's also there for the future because the housewife, they want to touch and feel the product when they, when they go and buy. But one of the things we've been looked in, we, we are looking into as a Danish, from a Danish crown point of view is how do we go in and offer a cutting plant and a packing plant or central packing and all that. And it, it, it sounds really great but they're still not ready for it. But the problem is, the, 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 the way they develop in China is that within five years, their demand for a packing plant in China is not one. They would need one in each city out there. So this will go fast when they get into that. And just down here on e-commerce and takeaway, it's the first city I've been to was in Beijing where I could get take McDonald's takeaway by the phone. So the small Chinese has developed their own business where you phone them on the line, they will go and pick up your McDonald's and they will deliver it to your home address or to your hotel. <coughs> they are, every Chinese will do whatever almost they can to business develop their own future, to safeguard their own future. And this is today a traditional retailer where you will have fish swimming around and you'll just pick one and within five minutes you will have it back. Fill it how you want it to. And yeah, and as you can see down here, it's, it's more a European style packaging, as we know. And then over here is to illustrate, I'm sorry for the picture, but feet here is actually traded higher than shoulder meat and bellies retailed. So trading with China, what does it then mean? First of all, you need to understand their culture and respect their culture. We cannot go out there and not try and study how they, how they operate and what they do. And we need to respect that very much. And then somehow you need to trust them. But you can never trust the Chinese. As our sales guy said, the first three business cards you get from a Chinese person, throw them in the bin because it's not his real name and it's not his number. <laughs> and I was really proud when I came home. I had a lot of business cards. <laughs> um, so this trust element is built up over time. You need to prove that you respect their culture and you understand their way of living. And then they will build their relationship with you. And it takes time, a lot of time. Quality of our product is paramount. Also out there, and I think sort of showed it before. But then this food safety, as you've got 300 million that has this European standard or US standard, living standard, they actually want safe products. And that is one of China's highest problems today is they don't really know how to control their whole supply base. And that's where we got an opportunity, not only as pork, but also of beef, beef and lamb, because they want our products. They know that the UK, the UK has a brand name out there that's saying it's food safety, it's, it's a high premium quality product, 
and they are prepared to pay for it. We've got a really good reputation and we need to care for that. Because a good example is on the wet markets, if you've got a bad name, they won't buy you. All our avatars, it's not sold on a tulip or Danish crown carton, they're actually sold on our established number. That will, that will be on the wet market on the front saying this, these products are from established number 320, which is one in Horsens. And that itself has a brand name for the consumer on the wet market. The problem is then that if they can't get hold of 320, they will then create them. Um, and we sh you will see that a lot as well, unfortunately. And that's the Chinese problem. And their biggest challenge is how do they actually control this and it's a strong word to use che cheating, but it is. They have a big, big problem with small businesses trying to replicate what is actually out there. Um, and, and, and that's our biggest concern going into a production in China uh, from a Danish crown point of view. We don't know if we can control it. We're still not approved. We do, K we do tins, small tins in a big factory in Denmark. We're not allowed to export them to China, but they are on shelf in China if you go into a supermarket. And we have asked ourselves, how did they come there? We bought a few tins, you couldn't see the difference. Apart from, we knew internally in the can, we have a different locking s lock system of the can, but on the outside, you couldn't see that was not from our factory. It said it was from our factory, it wasn't. And that's a big problem in China today. But again, they're doing a lot about it. The government is really, pushing hard to make sure that they can be trusted. So for them, it's also about long-term commitment. They're not here for the, for the short run. The reason why they bought Smithfield is for the long run, to, again, to make sure they got a supply chain they can feed their population to keep them calm. And then they have this preference, and it's, it's starting to change, but actually they were like fresh and not frozen. Unfortunately, from where we are, we have to send it in frozen. Um, and that's one of our biggest challenges. Could we get it in fresh? We can actually get, uh, obtain an even higher price from our products than we can today. <coughs> and then last, and I'm glad that John mentioned that now, also from a UK perspective, you need to be, have really good links within the, in, within the political structure out there. And just to hear that now it's been funded to get a person in from the British Embassy is really, really good for EBEX and for all the members in the UK, because that's where you really can es escalate to get access. From a Danish Crown point of view, and the Danish government, because we have a significant impact on the Danish economy, we were lucky that the government were behind this five, six years ago to put a person in place in Beijing to make sure they look after our interests as good as, good as they can, because you're not allowed to overstep the mark. If you do that, you're over. If they see you as bigger than them, then the Chinese will just lock you out from one day to another. Um, so it's important to understand all these regulations that is out there and coming back, respect their history and culture. This is just to give you a little bit of insight to, um, from a UK perspective, since we got the approval in, it was roughly in 11, 12, but as you can see, significant increase in volume, but more important, a really, really increase in our value that we get for our fifth quarter, that are then helping us to balance our carcass in a more efficient way. Because as Duncan was talking about previously, the pressure from the retailer is getting tougher and tougher. And everybody in, in the chain is squeezed, especially from the big four. And by having access to China, it's another way to make sure we can optimize <laughs> our pigs, pay a higher price to our farmers, uh, and so they can reinvest. So it sort of goes around and around and around. So the impact of China is quite big. Coming back to Russia was 10, 14p on the pig price, the same it will be in Denmark for if China closed tomorrow. It will be an absolute disaster. So just sort of to end it here, uh, China is a fantastic country to trade with, but also difficult. Um, and it's definitely worth to invest the, the money to get access to that. 
for, from, from a UK beef and lamb perspective, uh, you will see the return of investment being marginal to, uh, to, to what you have to put in. But there is a few, maybe months, maybe years, hard work in front of us. But if, if we do this, it'll be and quite an eye-opener and, and, and a new way of working, not only for farmers, but also for the abattoirs and the cutting plant in the UK. It will make the economy grow. Um, so just to end it here, Danish Crown has had a fantastic positive impact. Or China have had a fantastic positive impact on Danish Crown. And um, yeah, we are now at phase three where we need to think about establishing ourselves out there with production unit. Is that the right way? Don't know. There is still a lot to be explored in that because it's difficult. But definitely China is the future or Asia is the future for us. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>